Welcome to our discussion, Frightfully Chic, Noel Coward and Fashion. Uh, my name is Catty Pierce and I'm a curator at Guildhall Art Gallery. And now to introduce your panel for the evening, we have historian Lucinda Gosling, author of over 20 books, including Fashion, the Evolution of Style. She works at the Mary Evans Picture Library, the source for a number of images featured in our Noel Coward exhibition. We have Timothy Morgan Owen, an authority on Gertrude Lawrence and a major collector of memorabilia related to her life and work. He supervised Henry Wilkinson's reconstruction of Lawrence's Molinux gown from private lives that is also uh, featured in our exhibition. We have Michael Pick, fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is the author of eight books on design and the decorative arts, including Be Dazzled, Norman Hartnell, 60 Years of Glamour and Fashion, and Norman Hartnell's Biography several garments from his collection of 20th century couture are displayed in the exhibition. And we have also uh, Georgina von Etzdorf, one of Britain's most unique and renowned designers. Her partnership with Martin Simcox and Jonathan Doherty, the Georgina von Etzdorf company, built an international reputation on its exquisite hand-printed textiles experimenting with a multitude of creative techniques and media. Several of their luxurious dressing gowns in silk and velvet are on display in the exhibition. And your moderator for this discussion is Brad Rosenstein, the curator of Noel Coward Art and Style. For a decade, he was curator of exhibitions and programs at San Francisco's Museum of Performance and Design, where he organized over 60 exhibitions and his work has been seen internationally. He is a director of the Noel Coward Archive Trust in the US um, and he joins us from there. So it is a different time <laughs> um, in the US. Very different. It is for most of us, um, but welcome everybody. And I will now hand over to Brad to kick off our discussion this evening. Thank you so much, Caddy. It has been a complete pleasure of this process of working with the fantastic crew uh, at the Guildhall. Caddy and Elizabeth Scott, the director, and uh, it's a whole village of people who have supported the making of this show. It's really been a privilege uh, and a beautiful, beautiful venue, and I hope you'll all come to see the exhibition. Um, what I wanted to uh, kick off things with, because I thought it would give a lot of context to everything the four panelists are going to be discussing tonight, is to really take you on a kind of zoom through uh, of the high points of the exhibition, because there are so many ideas that are introduced there that I think will be really, really valuable and visual references that will be valuable for you to have uh, as we talk to the panelists. So I'm going to start off sharing my screen and hoping the tech gods are with us and that you're all seeing what I'm seeing, and that we've got slides. So frightfully chic. Um, I think this image, which is sort of our icon image for the show, um, really sums up what would be the quintessential idea of Noel Coward. Uh, this is from the premier production of his play Private Lives, um, the New York production. And I think this is the image that most of us have uh, of him in this incredibly debonair, suave, well-dressed, uh, silk dressing gowned, uh, romantic figure, uh, often with either at the piano with a song or with a witty repartee. Um, and this is the image um, that we have of Coward. And here, of course, with his great partner, Gertrude Lawrence, wearing her Molinux pajamas in that show, which also set an enormous style trend. Um, and I think this is, uh, this would be quintessentially, you know, who we understand as coward and the image that's come down to us. Um, but something that we really wanted to emphasize and the whole journey of the exhibition is really about this is first of all, um, that this was a completely constructed image. It was not at all where coward came from or who he was. This was a very self-consciously created image that he put out in the world. He, I think at, after a time, as anybody who's very successful at creating one image of themselves started to regret <laughs> it a bit, it was a bit too successful sometimes and could get him pigeonholed uh, as being only one thing. And the one of the other points we really wanted to make in the exhibition is that there was so much more to his work. I mean, obviously these drawing room comedies that we treasure today are fantastic examples of who he was, but it was actually only a small portion of the work this man did over his lifetime, which was extraordinary, all of which had an influence on fashion and style. Um, so first of all, to address where he came from, oops, I'm having problems already. Let me back up a minute.
there we go. Um, so first of all, Noel himself came from what he called genteel poverty. He grew up in suburban London uh, with a family that was about as far as you could get from cocktails and silk dressing gowns. Um, they were almost always on the edge of complete uh, catastrophe financially. His mother held the family really together through a series of boarding houses that she ran. And by the age of 11, he had gone on the stage professionally. There was a great call for boy actors in the theater of his day. And this is where he really starts seeing the world that he's going to aspire to um, in the uh, West End theater of his time. Uh, but this was something that was brand new to him and it's something that was very different and magical. Um, and the, the image that we have of Coward, you know, as someone who comes from a posh, you know, upper class background couldn't be further from the truth. He didn't go to university. He barely even went to school. From the age of 11 on, he was pretty much a full-time actor um, and he educated himself. Um, oh, I keep freezing. Uh, so what was he seeing? Well, his, uh, despite their poverty, his mother was an incredible theater goer, and she made sure uh, that they went to the theater as often as possible. And he encountered this absolutely magical world uh, on stage. Uh, he fell in love with Edwardian musical comedy and stars like Lily Elsie, who you see on the left, magical kind of Orientalist fantasies like Chu Chen Chow, which is represented in the figures on the right. These figures stayed with him forever. And even though, you know, this isn't exactly the kind of work that he would do, um, this kind of magic of the theater and the, its possibilities for illusion stayed with him very strongly. Um, and one of the ways that we uh, know about this and how strong an influence it was, we have Coward's notebooks from throughout his lifetime. The earliest one is pictured here that we have in the exhibition. And interestingly, unlike all the other notebooks, which are filled almost completely with uh, verbal entries, writing that we identify with Coward, this first notebook is almost all images, drawings that he did as in his teen years. Everything from people who lived in his neighborhood to people who were in his mother's uh, rooming house to these fantastic figures that he was imagining from uh, life on the stage. Um, and he has this very acute eye from the beginning about what costume represents, what it conceals, what it reveals about people. Uh, and this is something that would serve him throughout his career. And of course, this world that he goes into, the West End world of that time, theater couldn't have been farther from his own upbringing. And this is a, the magical world of the theater that he falls in love with and it immediately aspired to. Uh, and, uh, and part of that world was as much the world of the audience as it was the world of what was on stage. And he made his professional debut at age 20 as a playwright in the West End with his play, uh, I'll Leave It to You. And this uh, wonderful theater cave from 1920 by Lucille and Company um, is, uh, basically gives you a, an image of what an audience in Coward's Day would have looked like, particularly in the stalls that people went to see and be seen. And this was the world that he was now inhabiting uh, and glimpsing from, uh, from backstage as a boy actor. He really made his first breakthrough. He was also an aspiring songwriter and he became one of Britain's great songwriters of the 20th century. And his first real breakthrough came in the reviews, these evenings of songs and sketches, often comical, but not always, sometimes serious, sometimes even um, very dark and surreal. Um, and it started with a show called London Calling. And from the start, uh, fashion was an immensely important part of the reviews. And so often they would hire a great couturier or designer to at least do the star's costumes, if not all of them. Andre Charlo, who was producing this review, um, immediately hired Edward Molinux, who was already making a tremendous name for himself as Britain's leading couturier who had established a house in Paris. And he uh, commissioned him to do all the costumes for the first show. He and Coward collaborated tremendously on this show and became great friends. And for the rest of his life, basically, Molinux would often dress Coward's leading ladies all the way up to his final show in the 1960s, uh, Sweet in the Three Keys. And this is for a chorus number that he did called Other Girls, where Molinux came up with this very clever pattern of black and white that the girls could break off and rejoin and would constantly be creating these fascinating graphic patterns uh, on stage with the ensemble. Also in that review was his first show as an adult with his great partner, Gertrude Lawrence. They had grown up together as child actors uh, in the theater, but this was the first time they appeared together as adults. And it was a match made in heaven um, and one they would pursue um, subsequently in private lives and tonight at 8.30. 
um, she became a, an exemplar of his work, probably the best interpreter there's ever been uh, of Coward. She just understood the exquisite balance of comedy, drama, heart, sentiment, uh, wit, um, and it comes through uh, blazingly in some uh, beautiful audio recordings that she left of, of uh, that she did with Coward. Um, and he always felt that she was the best interpreter of his work. Um, and in that same show, she really became a star too in Parisian Pierrot, which was one of his first real hit songs of the time. It became one of the exemplary songs of the 1920s that's pictured on the left. Uh, and Coward looking very uncoward like in uh, Russian Blues, uh, a song he did that was really inspired in some ways by the world of Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, which had taken London by storm in the teens and was still having a huge effect on fashion uh, and image well into the 20s. Uh, and uh, Coward was absolutely thrilled. He got, he got to wear these wonderful Russian costumes uh, right off the bat. But the effect on fashion could also be very, very immediate. Um, and so if you went to one of these reviews and you saw Jesse Matthews in the premiere performance of A Room with a View, you could also turn to the page in your program that would tell you how to order uh, the exact dress that she was wearing uh, that was made to order for you. There was, uh, it could be that direct in terms of the effect it had on fashion. But of course, you know, everybody was attending Coward's premieres and the fashion side of what was worn on stage would often be as talked about as what was in the play itself. When he started working with Charles Cochran, who was really the Florence Ziegfeld of his time, things even went up a further notch with this kind of spectacle. And so his work can encompass these kinds of big chorus numbers with uh, Mr. Cochran's young ladies, as they were known, uh, which was a breeding ground for great stars of the time, Jesse Matthews uh, and the future Anna Neagle is also there on the right. But it could also veer into very dark and surreal and even subversive places. This is his song, Dance Little Lady, from his review uh, this year of Grace. And it's a very, very critical song of the wild world of the 1920s. And Coward had the idea of hiring the designer Oliver Messel to do these very surreal costumes and masks and created this really dark kind of Greek chorus effect that absolutely brought the house down. And again, set a kind of style for its time. He could do Busby Berkeley numbers like this from the finale from this year of grace, which also um, were very much affected by the energy and his love of the city of London that found its way constantly into his work in this period is very much a part of his style. And he could stage massive spectacles like Cavalcade with a cast and crew of 422 set changes on the massive stage of the Drury Lane. You know, these kinds of images aren't things that almost anyone would associate with Coward today, so far removed from the drawing room comedies for, for which he's best known. But for the audience of his time, this is who he was. And he was constantly popping out of a new rabbit hole with every season, constantly surprising people with the range of his work and also with how he seemed to master all of these forms. And of course, one of the reasons for this was the extraordinary designers uh, who he worked with. And so the next section of the exhibition um, talks about them in detail and really spotlights their contributions. This is a beautiful William Rothenstein portrait of Gladys Calthrop, who was his longtime collaborator, who we'll be talking about in much more detail, who had started out as a painter. She had no background uh, in theater design, but was a great friend of Coward's. And she soon was mastering everything. She could do right cutting edge contemporary work like the finale of Cavalcade seen here. She could do the Victorian ball gowns that swirled around the ballrooms of Bittersweet. She could do Regency Brighton uh, in both his sets and costumes that had such a tremendous impact in, uh, in Coward's musical conversation piece. Um, that it actually started a, a whole revival, a neo-regency revival in both uh, fashion and home decor um, based on the impact that these sets had. She became a real celebrity in her own right. She also, because she was a friend of Coward, had a huge role in uh, helping to decorate all his various homes. And then it came full circle when she did the designs for Coward's semi-autobiographical play, Present Laughter, which she kind of carefully and, and wittily lampooned a lot of the elements that she herself had put into Coward's various homes over the years. It became part of the joke. It became uh, art imitates life, imitates art. Uh, but this was, you know, because of her, you know, intimate relationship with Coward, she was able to bring this kind of sensibility to the work and the audience was appreciated the joke. This is a, a beautiful self-portrait by Dora Zinkeisen, um, who was another great um, female designer at the time. And one of the other very important aspects that we'll be going into later is, is how 
Tower championed these very strong creative women throughout his life, not just in his characters and in the women he represented on stage, but in those backstage as well. And uh, Zinkeisen worked with him from some of the early Cochrane reviews sporadically all the way into the 1950s. And she brought this very liberated woman's sensibility to the time. She was often very revealing of the female body in ways that were very daring uh, for the time, but very much in tune with the sexuality that Coward was making manifest. This was all part of her work at the time. She really brought something very special to his work. And of course, Edward Molyneux, who we've already mentioned, the great couturier of the time, who uh, worked on so many different Coward productions, including Private Lives, that iconic dress that we'll be talking about. Here's Judy Campbell in another one of his very typical uh, chic but simple, uh, almost Grecian in its simplicity kinds of gowns, but impeccably cut, beautiful fabrics. It was exactly the kind of uh, refined simplicity that Coward loved on stage. Norman Hartnell was the other extreme. He was a case of more is more. And uh, Michael in particular will be talking about his contributions, but um, he uh, worked with Coward on several occasions. He was not a favorite of Coward's because of his kind of over the top style, um, but he certainly saw the value of him. And, and Hartnell was certainly one of the most renowned designers of his time. Um, and he would work uh, most famously together with uh, Gertrude Lawrence designing her 20 costumes for the nine play cycle of Tonight at 8.30, both in London and New York. Uh, Victor Stiebel is someone else we'll be talking about too, who designed a number of uh, coward shows. Uh, this was a very daring, uh, the uh, strapless dress had just come into fashion in the late 1930s. And here's B. Lilly in one of his, uh, in a review that featured Coward's work called All Clear. Rain Shoes was another important feature of this time that we'll be talking about with Michael. Cecil Beaton, uh, the, another great British designer who originally started off despising Coward, had a real jealousy of the success he'd had in the theater. But they wound up bearing the hatchet and actually working together quite well. He shared Coward's love, the Victorian and Edwardian sensibility here uh, in his costumes and set designs for Quadril um, that starred the Lunts. And here in this kind of mad Art Nouveau world uh, of uh, the Belle Epoque Paris in the farce Look After Lulu. Uh, which not only looked back to the wild colors of people like Leon Boxed and the Ballet Russe uh, that Beaton adored, but also looked forward. This production was in 1959, but looked forward to the kind of psychedelia of the 60s. Um, and this uh, was as Coward's career started to migrate to New York, where more and more of his shows would uh, originate and then reverse their previous trend and then travel to London. Um, he started to work with American designers in the, in the theater, incredible designers like Irene Sheriff, and on stage with designers like uh, Mainbacher, as he was known in the US, Mamboche, when he had his house in Paris, uh, did all these wonderful uh, gowns for Mary Martin in the TV special uh, Together With Music. And then we also look at Coward offstage, this wonderful figure of uh, you know, fashion that he was. He was so acute in understanding his, his uh, self-image and packaging that from the uh, kind of decadence of the 1920s to the Savile Row sleekness of the 1930s, walking a very fine line in presenting. Um, you know, he was a gay man at a time when uh, it was a, a crime in Britain. So he had to present a very different public uh, image of himself. But um, the, uh, he was able to walk that line very finely with the, with the fashion that he exemplified. And he really became a different model of masculinity for men across the spectrum. And he got, his style got taken up um, by people from you know, every kind of background who were fascinated by this, by this different look and different sound, different style. Uh, he, of course, worked you know, uh, enormously and was great friends with a number of members of the aristocracy and the royal family, um, and uh, they figured a lot in his charity work with the Actors' Orphanage. He was able to remake himself in the 1950s when he was considered old hat, and he went on to conquer Las Vegas and remake his silk-dressing gown image in this triumphant picture of him, the Englishman out in the noonday sun of the Nevada desert, uh, which triumphantly led to a complete resurgence of his career all the way through his late films where he wore this wonderful Douglas Hayward bespoke suit, chocolate brown in, uh, in Boom that he loved so much. It became his favorite offstage uniform as well. And even had a copy made that he kept in New York uh, as, a, as a backup for when he was abroad. We look at his homes, which were always covered uh, extensively in the press because he was such an international star. 
his wonderful style, which was a mix of the traditional and the contemporary, which is still feels new and classic today. His love of painting, which often took in so much first of the English landscape. And then when he moved to established a home in Jamaica in what he called his touch and Gauguin painting period, um, he picked up those colors and it, it was able to release the kind of peacock side of himself that he couldn't uh, when he was at home. And finally, in the last part of the exhibition, it looks at the effect it's had on contemporary fashion um, and uh, everything from luxury hotel suites around the world that are still named in his honor, fragrances that are modeled, named after him, uh, thanks to his love of, of scent that uh, figures throughout his work, revivals of his paintings, which are now fabulously collectible. The designer Anna Sweeve modeled a whole collection in 2017 uh, that was inspired by the Technicolor 1945 film version of Bly Spirit, pictured in the background. These Ray Robbins dresses are something Michael will talk about. But you know, an, a contemporary designer who's uh, you know uh, inspired by this work and carrying it forward into the present, as we'll be, of course, talking with Georgina about here. So thank you for indulging me, but I think you'll find all of that some useful background. And I'll now turn things over to Lucy. We'll talk about the wonderful Gladys Calthrop. Thanks, Brad. Um, well, as I was introduced, I work at Mary Evans Picture Library and we are a long established historical resource of imagery and we have a fantastic magazine archive. So what I thought I'd do um, was sort of dive into the archive and see what I could find on Gladys um, and find images which uh, speak about her style and, uh, and how that kind of interplayed with her work with Noel Coward. Uh, so we start with this image, which um, obviously that image of Gertrude Lawrence and Noel Coward together is so iconic, but this is a sort of riff on that, that, that pose, you know, Noel with another female collaborator. And um, it's, it's a wonderful picture that sums up their relationship. They were very close friends from 1921 when they met. He, he first met her in Alassio in Italy. And Alassio is, is interesting that they met there because uh, it, people know about um, high society traveling to the Riviera, but Alassio was also a real kind of enclave for um, British holiday makers at the time in the sort of 20s and 30s. So Noel Coward was at the English club in Alassio and uh, did a turn, did a, um, did a few songs and he noticed a young woman in the front row uh, who was helplessly giggling at his singing and afterwards he had to go up to her and ask what she had found so funny and she said it wasn't so much the singing it was just the way he looked when he was doing it and anyway what that, what that triggered was um, a lifelong friendship between the two and an incredible synergy in terms of their creativity uh, which was very very much on a sort of similar plane with each other um, and Gladys went on to collaborate and be the stage designer for so many of his productions. Um, but in herself, she was a very sort of chic woman. Um, should we have a look at the next picture actually, Brad? Um, there we go. I wanted to show this image, which I was sort of delighted to find, which is from the Sketch magazine from 1915, August 1915, when she married. And there she is, bottom right, Gladys Treby of Devon, from a good family in Devon. And there she is aged, well, I suppose she'd be um, 21 then, getting married to an army officer, um, Everard Calthrop. So I thought it'd be really interesting to put this in, showing Gladys as, you know, one of many um, <laughs> young um, women who had probably gone to a, a, a good school and she'd gone to finishing school in Paris and, and they're all lining up to get married to their um, gallant army officers and she's just one of them and so it's a, it seems to be an incredible leap uh, to go from that to that picture we've just seen of this you know just frightfully chic woman very self-possessed very confident and a real kind of renaissance woman um, you know, I, I, I want to talk about her fashion, but I also want to talk about how a lot of what she did, her lifestyle was all part of that kind of image, this image she cultivated of just being very, very stylish and chic. So I, I can't remember what's coming up next, but show me and then I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this is um, a group at the Chelsea Arts Club Ball in I think 1926. Um, now there's Gladys on the left, and she's next to Ivan Novello, 
and next to Ivan Novello is Gladys Cooper, and on the end, obviously, is Noel. Um, so this is a great picture. Charles, Chelsea Arts Club Ball it was a huge, big annual event for which sort of mixed high society with bohemian artistic circles, and everybody came dressed up to the nines. And there's Gladys wearing a sort of a Spanish mantilla, I suppose. Um, and what I quite like, actually, is um, Brad talked about how the theatre was a, a you know a, a complete area for people to share fashion, and not, not just on the stage, but also what people were wearing in the audience. And Gladys, who you know was so res was responsible for all the behind the scenes stuff that was going on in Noel Coward's um, shows, um, in herself she was quite a sort of fashion, you know, a real sort of fashion plate. And she was often written about, there's a, a regular column in the Illustrated Sporting Dramatic News written by Florence Roberts called Fashion in Stage and Stalls. And there's this wonderful little clip saying, um, Mrs. Gladys Culthrop when accompanying Noel to the first night of Caroline, she's described as severely eaten cropped and picturesquely Spanish shawled. Now Spanish shawls were such a fashionable item in the 1920s. So she sort of dressed up, um, you know, a little bit. Um, and it looks like Ivan Novello is some kind of um, sort of Romany um, type, you know, probably about to dance a tango in a, in a back alley or something, I imagine. But anyway, so Gladys is channeling a bit of Spanish style there, uh, which is very 1920s. Um, let's go on to the next picture. Yes, um, so this is a house that she um, bought near Ashford and Kent, not too far from where Noel lived, um, and again, featured in the Sketch magazine. And she converted an old mill and she just, um, you know, I think this was not the norm. This was a woman who was very sort of confident in her choices, in her lifestyle choices. And this was her bolt hole, which was this sort of wonderful rustic retreat. Uh, as you can see, she's keeping goats and things. And it's styled in, you know, quite a... Um, probably a rustic style, um, you know, compared to some of these incredibly modern sets she, she is uh, producing for Noel's uh, plays. This is sort of the opposite, but I kind of wanted to show this because, again, it was unusual enough to be featured in the magazine. Uh, this was actually double page spread, this is just one page of it. Let's go on to the next picture. And this is her studio in Westminster. Uh, which was often described in the press as being very, very, um, very chic, very uh, white and cream walls. You see that um, sofa down there. She was often pictured curled up on that, um, drawing or reading, smoking. Uh, I've, se I've seen quite a lot of photographs of her on there. And that's very much, um, you know, I suppose this is urban Gladys and the mill was country Gladys and she could sort of skip between the two and always look very stylish while doing it. Let's see what's coming up next. I'm not sure where this was taken this picture um, but it's um, appeared in The Bystander in 1936 um, with a, a brief pro profile about her and one thing that um, is often reported, she made her own clothes, which I don't suppose is particularly um, unusual because she designed costumes as well as stage sets. Um, none of these, but she, she would not design day wear. She felt that was too arty um, to, to, you know, that costume designers shouldn't design day wear, but she would design evening wear. And I do wonder about that outfit, whether that is one of her own creations, it could possibly be. But, you know, she was, she knew how to dress. She always looks impeccably turned out. She kept this very short haircut, even when people were growing their hair. Um, and she was just very, very neat. Uh, let me let me just share with you a few more uh, quotes from, from the press. I rather like this one, which is talks of Gladys when she's seen again with Noel, bringing up the rear of the convoy, the convoy of Noel sort of inner circle, that is a trim little spick and span little galleon in her own right, is the person responsible for four words which on any theatre programme are an absolute guarantee of good taste. Decor by Gladys Calthrop. 
Let's go on to the next one. All oh, right, well, this is at the Sank Port Flying Club. And there's Gladys, and I think uh, that's uh, Joyce Carey next to Noel there. Um, so high society and aviation were a match made in heaven in the 1930s, and Gladys uh, learned how to fly. And, and she didn't just learn how to fly and sort of dabble in it, she actually flew over to Paris to deliver costumes to actresses, things like that. And there she is, uh, looking super stylish in her aviator's gear. So this is all part of this, you know, wonderful lifestyle that she she had. Um, I should mention that her, um, you know, she separated from her husband. She had one son, Hugo, who um, actually was killed in the Second World War. But we never see Gladys, the mother. Uh, and I, you know, I believe um, her son was probably looked after by her own mother more than herself. Um, I wanted to show this one, and this actually was published in 1940, but I. I'm not sure if it might have been taken a little earlier. However, what I really love about it is a monogram jumper and monogrammed outfits was such the rage in the sort of 1930s. You would see the Duchess of Windsor wearing them and things. So again, it's just Gladys on the, you know, just on point with, with, um, with fashion. And she also really loved jewelry. And even her at times obituary talked about her penchant for barbaric jewelry. And I like that big rock on her hand there. Uh, but she's wearing earrings and she often wore lots of earrings as well and sort of, you know, lots of necklaces. And then finally, I want to um, share this one. Now, this, this photograph, I think uh, the actual print of it is in the National Portrait Gallery, but it's by a photographer called Howard Costa. Now, Howard Costa billed himself as Howard Costa photographer of men and he always gave sort of, you know, uh, portrayed his subjects in very dramatic lighting. And I think it's interesting. I don't want to particularly read anything too deeply into this, but I do think it's interesting that Gladys decided to choose Howard Costa for this really splendid, dignified portrait of herself. Um, this is 1936. And what I think is really interesting about what she's wearing is um, it's showing the kind of more sinuous bias cut fashions of the mid 1930s, just beginning to give way to something a little bit more structured in the later 1930s. And that um, blouse that she's wearing with a sort of frog, a braided frogging, uh, I've seen her in a couple of different outfits with, with that. And it, it almost, um, you know, recalls various historical, um, costumes that she had created for Noel, uh, but I think it's really, you know, she's portrayed really fantastically there. Um, and, you know, the wonderful thing about Gladys is she was very close to Noel, they collaborated on so many different projects, but she also went off and did her own thing as well, and Noel was very supportive of that. Um, she stayed in New York, she worked with Ava Le Gallien's Civic Repertory Company as the art director, so she wasn't you know, she wasn't um, in Noel's shadow. She was very much um, a, create, a, a strong creative individual in her own right and her own personal style certainly reflects that. Thank you so much, Lucy. A um, lot of wonderful insights there. Um, two little footnotes I'd give and then we'll move on to, to Timothy's presentation. One of the key things, because they were so close, um, is that Gladys's sets and costumes often were created at the very moment that the plays that she was creating them for, Noel's work, were evolving. They would talk about these things from the inception of an idea. Yeah. And she was often designing sets while he was writing the plays. So these environments were being created very much in tandem with each other. His thinking about how the play progressed dramatically would be based on her ideas for the sets and vice versa. They would influence each other enormously. Um, she had a huge and impact. She always attended rehearsals as well. So, you know, they, those ideas developed as, the, as the, the play took shape as well. Exactly. And, um, you know, you were being a little bit discreet, but, you know, it was, it was pretty well known that throughout most of her life, Gladys's, most of her relationships were with women, yeah. which was yeah. often, you know, a very important subtext to this world. And it's something that we talk about in the exhibition. So much of this, especially creative design world that was around Coward, were uh, gay and lesbian 
members of the theatrical community who also gave each other incredibly creative support uh, as well as moral support and what which must have been a difficult time that Chelsea Arts Ball was one of the few public occasions where people could be openly gay uh, in the social life of the time and so all of that also filters into their work together which I think is important yeah absolutely. yeah thank you um, and Timothy um, tell us about Gertrude Lawrence <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll start off with a quote. Um, Laurence Olivier said Gertrude Lawrence was not just an actress. She was a blazing great star whose like we shall never see again. Audiences were mesmerized by her, critics eulogized over her, and leading playwrights and composers wrote specifically for her. Top couturiers clothed her for nothing, and some of the most dashing, eligible men in the, in the world wanted to marry her. She set fashions, becoming one of the best dressed women in the world. Her clothes, jewels, furs, apartments, cars, and glamorous lifestyle became legendary. She created a whirlwind of excitement wherever she went. Whatever she did was news. She was the first celebrity of the modern age. And in fact, as somebody once said, that Card was the first celebrity, but actually she was, became famous before he did. So, uh, but even a, high, a highly bankrupt, uh, publicized bankruptcy case in 1935 didn't dull her popularity. And for over, a quarter set, for over a quarter of a century, she was one of the most famous and photographed and the highest paid stage actress on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, Gertrude Lawrence's sort of rise, for, it was rags to riches, a bit like Noel Card, but she was slightly, came from a poorer, more impoverished background. Um, it, she was working class. Her parents were struggling musical actors. Um, and that's all she, she had to work to survive. And that's all she knew. So she went into the theatre. Um, she met, as you have said, Card when they were in their early teens or sort of 12, 14. And um, uh, she was a, a, a teacher pupil at the Italia Conti Stage School. So she helped out to be able to get classes. Um, and as Coward said, from the moment he met her on the train to Liverpool, he loved her from then onwards and she became his muse. Uh, here we have her in 1931 in New York, wearing uh, some Molyneux or Molyneux um, new Molyneux, as the French would say, um, pajamas that were done for an advert, advertising his wares. She became completely dressed by and his um, Molyneux's uh, muse um, from 1930 in Private Lives. Uh, that's when he first clothed her for nothing. I mean, here they are, card in the pre-publicity photographs of Private Lives. We've created this dress um, for the exhibition, recreated this dress for the exhibition. And it is probably the, one of the most iconic dresses of the 1930s. Uh, Gertrude Lawrence was bronzed because she had, she also, she, she helped publicize and make fashionable the suntan along with Noel Card. And she had the first sun machine in Britain. Um, they rehearsed private lives in the south of France at Molyneux's villa in, at Cap Dye. And it, uh, Noel Card said from the moment when he, oh, here we are again in, uh, she's, this is in the second act in, her, in the pajamas, the golden brown pajamas that uh, again, are some of the most iconic sort of ensembles of the, of the 1930s. Um, she's got a gold bracelet with little charms. And this is the, the ensemble that she wore in the last act in New York, not in London. But it is un total understated chic, which is quite unlike what we think of the 1930s now, because our concept of the 1920s and 30s and 40s comes from Hollywood, which was a heightened chic and uh, meant to be more sort of striking than was actual reality. This is Gertrude Lawrence learning, reading her script at Molyneux's villa in the south of France. Now, whether she's wearing Molyneux at this point, I don't know. Um, and another one of her, uh, and it, uh, her caption on the back of this photograph um, is my kind of rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and here's the dress. Uh, this was taken for Vanity Fair and they've turned the um, waistband around uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Gertrude Lawrence had, had a very na high natural waist and incredible limbs, wonderful shoulders, long languid limbs and very long legs. So it, it, the dress has become timeless by removing, by swiveling the buckle round to the back, which wouldn't have been seen because the belt didn't go all the way round. It went through the back of the dress, we discovered. And here again, this is the whole ensemble, which is, uh, it's black three quarter length coat trimmed in Arctic Fox. And the coat actually has then a jacket on it so the fox swings, which is quite interesting. And apparently women drooled with envy. Now here is, <laughs> here is the dress being, uh, we found, or I found the most incredible young man who makes costumes called Henry Wil Wilkinson. Um, and he, was, he and I researched the dress and looked at all the photographs under magnifying glasses to see how it was done. And it is quite extraordinary and here, here is the dress uh, sort of being made. And we discovered that the diamond panels were sewn onto a dress and then they cut away from the back. Um, and also the dress was very long, it, had, uh, it was very low at the back. So it, it was quite difficult. It was also uh, made in a synthetic fabric, either ray, probably rayon, which was made from wood pulp. Uh, all those sort of synthetic fabrics of the 1930s, which were quite extraordinary. The process was lost in the war when factories were turned over to make other things. And then afterwards, um, oil-based fabrics, nylon and acrylic came in, um, hyped up by the oil companies. And we are now going back to these uh, natural synthetic fabrics. And here is the dress in the exhibition um, made by Henry. And it is quite stunning. It really is. And one can see that why it caused a sensation on her very dark sun bronze, you know, dark suntan. And she had one white pearl and one black pearl the size of duck's eggs and, a, and diamond bangles um, that jangled up and down her arms because she never ever stopped moving. Uh, this is uh, Molinux at his, again at his best. Uh, a masterpiece in bias cutting in wool jersey. It was brown and cream taken in 1932. Um, and then you've got the advent of sort of pop art that came in much later with the, with the dots behind her. But she was considered one of the best dressed women in the world and it was her natural ease of wearing clothes. She wore clothes, clothes didn't wear her and she just threw things on. She used to say glamour is as glamour does. Which reveals a lot about why Noel would have loved her. Um, yes, so much she about was, she was she was great fun and very funny. But unlike people that are witty, wit wit is remembered. Funny being funny is not remembered, and she never stopped moving and she was always larking lark, larking about, um, and she had this, this incredible figure. Even at 1950 in 1952 or 51, I've got photographs of her doing a pastiche of the South Pacific for the first anniversary of The King and I, which she starred and died in. Um, and her body is pretty good for a 50, I think she was about 53 then. I was just wondering what she would have worn underneath that wet that, that white dress. Um, probably nothing. Yeah. Uh, in Nymph Errant, um, John Kavanagh, who was Molino's boyfriend and assistant, told me that she had a dress that she had to do a high kick in, and it was chiffon. And if she'd worn underpinnings, they'd have shown through. So she didn't wear anything, but they had collots underneath. So she <laughs> revealed herself. <laughs> I was going to say, there was, there was an advert, a Harrods advert in 1936, where Gladys was giving a presentation at Harrods on behalf of the lingerie firm Sharno, which was all about. Hey, um, Sharnos. Sh 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 no, no, Charles, because I, I, they were great friends of mine. Charles oh, Nosby. Oh, yes. No, no, not Charles. Well, it's C H A R N A U X. So oh, I don't, oh, right, Charles. Yeah, sorry, not, not the, 
not the hosiery, more the lingerie. Oh, right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. But, um, you know, the whole thing about this was Gladys was going to talk about how will they dress when speed makes it possible to breakfast at the pyramids, lunch at Hollywood and dine at Le Touquet in a day. So, <laughs> <well>. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And Michael, are you with us? I know he was having some technical issues before. Oh. Michael, are you there? Oh, he looks like he's frozen. We can't hear you, Michael. Can you unmute? No, not working. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Very good. Yeah, sorry, I've had to go to another machine. It's uh, it's all a bit fraught. Oh, that's <laughs> I all good. Hold the microphone. I don't know what's going on. Well, anyway, wonderful. We can uh, hear you. Thank you for including me, and I hope you can. If you can't hear me, do let me know. Yes. No, you're <laughs> coming through loud and clear. Thank you. Good. Now, <clears throat> you asked me to provide a, a very short resume in a way of. The main dress designers which um, Noel Coward liked to use. And I really thought that I just go back a moment when Coward himself was considered an arbiter of style, which was in the late 20s. And he was on a liner going back to Britain and he'd been horrible to Cecil Beaton. And Cecil Beaton was very upset by this because he didn't really like Coward anyway. He didn't really seem to like many people. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Coward then gave him a little lecture on how to dress and say, You'll, you wave your arms around too much, your sleeves are too tight, uh, you should never wear a lot of matching clothing. I like a good match myself, he said, but I won't allow myself to do it very often because it causes comment. Now, all this plays into what uh, has already been discussed, that uh, Molly Nukes, Hartnell, and Victor Stiebel were, of course, all gay at a time when being gay was fine in the world they were in, but outside they more or less conformed to the norms. So looking, looking not gay was the best solution. And I think really that Gertrude Lawrence bridged all of these people. She obviously had a, a more than a more than amazing theatrical ambiance around her, as uh, Timothy's just explained. Now, she used several designers herself, and I'm always intrigued as to why Coward would have gone to meet Molyneux. Well, he met Molyneux in Paris. I start with Molyneux because all these men were all self-made, um, including Coward, and it's not good to look back always at history. We should look at it from the point of view of the time. Actors and actresses were not really considered socially very acceptable. Some of them were, some of them were knighted, some were given a damehood, but only when they were very old. They were still considered to be rather louche and not quite the thing. Coward, particularly with his play The Vortex, which caused an incredible stare at the time. So much so that people really thought that it was the end of the world practically along with short skirts that were coming in. But Gertrude Lawrence seems to have been a linchpin for all these designers. And I start with a, a photograph which she gave to her shoemaker, Edward Rain, because it shows her no doubt wearing a Molyneux dress in the twenties and her footwear was always something that had to be considered, as you've shown in your exhibition. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> in your exhibition, it was one of those facets which meant that if she was comfortable wearing footwear, practically anything she wore would work. So if we could go on to the next um, slide. <clears throat> All of these people remained friends for the rest of their lives throughout the 20th century. When Coward had his huge re revival in the 60s, I was a teenager and I 
couldn't understand why anybody was particularly interested in Noel Coward or Gertrude Lawrence, particularly when, they, when what their recordings were played. And of course, they were satirized in programs like Round the Horn. But I, I suddenly saw that actually they had created the look of the 20th century as, as far as clothes were concerned. Now, this is quite late on, as you see this photograph. It's towards the end of their lives. There's Edward Molyneux sitting in Paris with Noel Coward, who's just having a revival, as was Molyneux. He closed his business in 1950 and reopened it in, 19, in, in 1964 or five. And there is Margaret Layton, who was actually a consummate Hartnell client. So these worlds all overlapped. And very often, it was, wasn't so much that Coward wanted a designer, I think, as the fact that the actress wanted a particular designer. And that was shown by um, Hartnell, who designed for Sirocco. He designed dresses for Frances Doble. I think she was called Doble. And um, they were considered a huge success, whereas the play was panned. And Nell Coward and Norman Hartnell fell out from there on. So the next production, which Hartnell was asked to design clothes for, he wasn't asked to do so by Coward. He was asked to do so by Charlet. And he designed 24 outfits to be worn in the show, which was supposed to be of uh, bathing dresses worn at the beach in Cannes. Well, Coward hated them, so they were all dropped. So the enmity carried on there, curiously. Uh, that later on, they had a rapprochement, but there was a distinct frado. I would say Hartnell actually was rather pleased by this because he then sold the whole collection to an American buyer from um, Palm Beach who made a fortune for him. But all of these men were self-made. Now, the doyen, if you like, was definitely Molyneux, who'd begun his career before the First World War. His father was a commercial traveler, and he worked for Lucille, as everybody knows, as a designer. And then after a distinguished career in the war, um, he opened his own house in 1919 in Paris and moved to London later. Um, Hartwell rather resented that because he thought that he was creating his own business in London. He wasn't successful when he opened his Paris house, but he certainly became hugely successful in London. Victor Stiebel came along around 1930, and uh, like Hartnell, he'd been up at Cambridge, he'd acted in Footlights, and um, he made clothes which Hartnell described as very like my own, but much cheaper which was a kind of a stab in the back. But Stiebel had his own style too. Um, Molly Nukes, as you see here, had one huge advantage for a time, which was that he dressed the glamorous Princess Marina for her wedding to the Duke of Kent in 1934. Um, but it didn't actually get, get a lot of royal clients for him because he... He wasn't as established as Hartnell had become. Hartnell opened in 1923. And by 1934, he was actually dressing the uh, cream of British society. If we can move on to the next one. And his great coup was to receive the wedding dress commission from Princess Alice, who became the Duchess of Gloucester. Well, it was one of those things that... Um, didn't work particularly well for him. This is a wonderful portrait by Vond, with whom Hartnell collaborated on several occasions. But because of the death in the family of the Duchess, the wedding was held in private. And he, Hartnell had designed this extraordinary dress to fill Westminster Abbey's aisle. So he didn't actually succeed very far with his publicity then. But he did gain an enormous amount of acclaim for the trousseau which she then wore and which was plastered all over the newspapers worldwide. So in that sense, this was another coup for him. But also in that year, 
as has just been said, he, he began to dress Gertrude Lawrence. I, I believe that um, she was unable to pay the Molyneux's bills and Hartnell took her on as a client um, for some years and produced very successful clothes for her indeed. This is Hartnell designing later in the 40s for the royal family because none of the other designers had this dual edge. Hartnell designed a lot for the theatre, for Cochrane, for other productions. He designed for films very early in the 20s and right through almost until he died. So that was another, another facet of his career. The other thing is that um, Coward was introduced to Molyneux by uh, Elsa Maxwell or the other way around. Elsa Maxwell, of course, started a nightclub <clears throat> with, um, with Molyneux in Paris. So there were these various shades of self-made people all moving in their spheres which often overlapped, which is the interesting thing. This, of course, is a famous dress for Gertrude Lawrence by Hartnell. <clears throat> Can we move on? And then, latterly, we had um, Victor Stiebel. I think I've missed some pictures here because I was going to speak about Victor Stiebel here, but this is now Ravis, so that's fine. That's, that's Victor Stiebel at home in the Albany, which he shared with his, um, his friend Richard Adensall, the composer, who worked on a couple of Coward's films. And also, uh, Coward did use Stiebel designs. Curiously, I've seen a, a Stiebel design for Blythe Spirit, but I think for the stage version, for a dress worn by Kay Hammond on, on stage, not in the film. Stiebel had a, had a little roster of extremely famous stars of stage and screen, including Vivian Lee, as you'll see here in the next slide. And this is quite an early version again, as we've just heard earlier, of um, a strapless dress. This is actually 1937. And he's also adapted the crinoline to his, um, to his designs, which Hartnell had revived previously for um, Queen Elizabeth for her state visit to Paris. <clears throat> but in the film of Blythe Spirit, uh, Ravis was given the design work. Now, Raymond and Dora Ravis were a tour de force. Um, like Stiebel, they were actually originally from South Africa and their name was in fact Davis and their mother had had a corsetry workshop on South Molden Street and they branched out from that very successfully. Towards the end of, of the careers, Ray um, survived Dora who um, had been a bit of a thorn in the side of Ray. Well, Ray told me that she had been. I don't know if that's true, but they argued nonstop. They also argued nonstop with their clients. And I can think the only, could we move on to Ray Ravis now, do you think? The only reason I can think that, um, no, that's not his <laughs> going back, I think. But the only thing I think about Ray Ravis was that um, she got the job because Havelock Allen, who was the producer of Blythe Spirit, had been married, or was then married actually, still to Valerie Hobson, who'd worn Ravis clothes in, in a previous film produced by um, Havelock Allen. And also, she was the subject of a very famous photograph by Beaton, taken in the bombed Vogue studios when she wore her rather beautiful Ravis evening dress. Now, the Ravis sisters were quite apart from the world of Noel Coward. I, I would love to know what he would have thought of them because no one I've spoken to really, I'm afraid, and I knew Vue Ray at the end of her life, has much to say about them in the way of intellect or humour. Ray certainly had no sense of humour that one could discern and she was forever having blazing rows with everything, everybody, including clients. So that's a little insight into the world which Coward moved, the periphery of his world rather, the designers. 
and how they were all self-made people uh, really egging each other on, I think, it seems to me. And I have to say her designs for Blythe Spirit are quite beautiful. Um, they, they certainly were. And years ago, when some of these older designers were still alive, they all said, well, the reason she was never admitted to Inksop was because she just ripped off everybody else's designs all the time. She wasn't a particularly <laughs> original designer. But I think she was a very fascinating character. And I ended that with Hartnell, Hartnell's great coronation dress, which is really the iconic dress of the 20th century, because it shows really that when it came to staging things, Hartnell was as good as anybody. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure. And with Georgina von Etzdorf, we now come to um, Coward's ongoing influence. And I was fascinated. I was so pleased to be able to include some of her work in the exhibition. And even more so as we had a chance to talk about her background, to find out what her own Coward connections were and other sources of inspiration. So take it away, Georgina. Thanks, Brad. Um, well, I, I suppose my first, um, my first brush and very importantly with Noel Coward was through my mother, who was a huge fan of his songs and knew his songs intimately, sang them all the time. And we all listened to them um, and her, her performing them and so on. So my, my real introduction um, came through, through that, those means and it was only really rather later that I um, I started sort of being um, fascinated by um, his uh, style, the elegance and the glamour and um, the, 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 the thought that actually, you know, elegance and glamour and so on needn't um, always be connected with um, uh, you know, having a lot of money to put things together, but more of a sense of how you, um, what you appreciated and what you could put together and make and feel for yourself to be glamorous. Um, we started out, this is a picture of the three of us who first started out in 1981, um, designing and printing fabric, actually. Um, we started there with a view to um, as, uh, selling the fabric to designers who would go wild and want to make things in our fabrics. Um, this actually sort of didn't quite work out as we thought. Well, there were two strands of it, actually. Um, we, uh, 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 there were, one was that designers on the whole have their own ideas about um, what they want to make in terms of clothing. And the other was that when we um, set out to print our materials, the plan was to use the textile, the existing textile industry to um, create what uh, we had envisaged. And that didn't work either because um, it turned out that the textile industry was very cautious about um, trying fabrics which had been used in the past um, and perhaps their companies had printed upon them and so on and experimented with them but um, that had been laid aside in favor of things which are more um, commercial and uh, less daring and so we we set about producing our own materials for our own ends and we started out then um, producing things which were um, accessories fundamentally initially and these went into very rapidly went into garments and the very first things we made were uh, dressing gowns and pajamas, uh, waistcoats, uh, smoking jackets but this is a picture that appeared in Vogue in 1984 um, using our, um, our robe which was fashioned on a 1920s drop-waisted um, idea where you could 
tie it any way you liked. You could have it dropped below your hips. You could tie it up at the front to wear as a coat. You could tie it around the back and so on. The idea being that actually a robe wasn't just for indoors. It could be worn outside. And here it's teamed with a pair of plaid trousers and uh, leopard, you know, tiger fake pony skin shoes and so on, but very elegant. And the idea being that you could transform whatever you had turn it from day into night. And um, we made a real hit with that at the time. It just captured the zeitgeist of the moment. Um, here's another picture from Vogue where um, this fabric is a, a silk jacquard, which we had woven to our own design upon which we printed our own silk um, design called Neptune. And, um, Teamed with that is a pair of our pajamas, where again using the jacquard, but turning the jacquard into the reverse. So printing on one side of it and making it up on the reverse side to make it look woven, uh, not just printed. And then she's also wearing a pair of gloves, which we did in printed um, jersey. Um, okay, so we're, we're rushing through the photos, which Sorry, is a good no, idea. It's, it's no, it's okay. <laughs> It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Um, more elements of um, the, the sort of materials we pioneered at the time, which again wasn't what people in the textile industry wanted to do at all. This was one of the first velvets we printed. It was a discharge printed rayon velvet um, made into a man's robe. Um, because the thing about the robes were that they were completely, and the pajamas and so on, that were they completely androgynous. It they were made for all, and um, we had many photos, which unfortunately I haven't been able to um, winkle out at this stage of, of of lots of men wearing our our dressing gowns, our pajamas, our waistcoats, our cravats, and so on. Um, and again, they were they were very so they were louche, they were glamorous, they were, you know, you could you could sort of play them up and play them down. And this is just one of the examples of that. This design was called Armada. Um, another beautiful picture uh, from American Vogue of one of our dressing gowns. I think this was a man's dressing gown, but again worn in a in a way that uh you could you know it, it's set in a setting which is very um homey and casual and so on and it just gave the appearance of kind of nonchalant elegance um and casual style um this is a beautiful image, which I love, taken by um, Howard, uh, Howard Suley, wonderful photographer, um, of one of our Devore uh, shawls. And it just shows the, the, the amazing uh, ability of Devore, which eats away the surface fabric, which in this case was a white, solid white velvet and replaces it with two dyeing methods, two printing methods to produce this. So there was no hint of where the fabric started and how it, it was completed other than what you see now. And um, it was a very glorious and luxurious fabric to work with. And we, again, we pushed that element with the help of a wonderful printer called uh, Patricia Belford who pioneered a lot of these, bringing back these techniques, which we um, worked with her on actually. And uh, we were very lucky to do that. So that, again, those were the, the thing, the garment I'm wearing is a, is a, is a robe made in, um, in the Devore technique, uh, printed and dyed several times, once to dye the silk, which is the background, and the other, the next time to dye the velvet. And it's all um, cut away and very glorious and delicious to wear. <laughs> um, uh, just an image showing how our accessories were very often used in unusual ways. This was a silk velvet that we had dyed in two colors and we did a series of these two color items which were 
paired with our printed things so that you could, you know, put together a, a combination of things which was about color, about texture and about print. Um, based on this one was based on the Firebird and um, those are our gloves as well. So here I, I managed, I did manage to find a, an image of a chap in morning dress uh, with the silk cravat and a silk waistcoat. We made many waistcoats in lots of different styles. And they again were very, very much sought after by all sorts, men and women alike. Um, many men use them for their weddings. And, um, and we had such a lovely uh, feedback from people who um, had fond memories of wearing their waistcoats and then finding they couldn't fit into them uh, 20 or 30 years later without a gusset inserted. <laughs> Um, here, just to show, this was a collection that we made with embroidering velvet. So we dyed the velvet, we um, embroidered it with a pattern uh, using a very fine French knot and um, made them up into accessories. And again, they were, they were men's, they were women's. They had a kind of, again, a sort of casual nonchalant glamour. You didn't have to be dressed up to wear them, but to put them on gave you another element, another layer, and perhaps a hint of, I don't know, a sort of a louche glamour, I would say. Mm. And yeah, here are the things that uh, you chose, Brad, for um, the show in, in London. And um, the first robe is a man's robe called Casino, and it was based on a collection called Fit Bourgeois when we were struggling, actually. And so we were doing all sorts of ironic titles for our collections because it was Fit Bourgeois, place your bets. And so it was also, please buy this. So um, this was one of the um, garments that we produced and um, it's, it's much treasured. I know a number of people who have this particular one, but we never produced more than about maximum, I think, 10 per item because they were the, the most um, aspirational purchase from Georgina Von Etzdorf. The second one along is a woman's, um, but also could have been worn by a man, smoking jacket, or I know in the States, I heard someone calling it a host coat which I thought was very um, amusing. I don't know why, sorry, I, I, no offense meant. Um, but um, it was uh, lovely in a rayon velvet. The previous one is a cotton velvet. This is a rayon velvet and it has a sheen and it has a, a, a sense of um, stained glass, stained glass feel, the colors completely glow. And as you move, um, uh, the fabric changes and the colors emerge and disappear a bit like a, the breast of a, an exotic bird. And the final image, um, which is hard to see here, is in a, a lovely, very heavy, floppy um, uh, silk twill. Uh, again, a man's dressing gown, very much in the style of Noel Coward, something that you would most definitely change into at home with your cravat, with your uh, cigar, with your, you know, whatever you were, lounge there with your double whiskey and um, entertain your friends and um, listen to music and occasionally uh, sachet around your beautiful uh, boudoir. So um, yeah, that's, that's it. This is the quintessential pictures that I've shown for um, Georgina von Etzdorf, uh, of which there are many others, but I, I hope those illustrate um, my uh, love and, and our, um, my two partners, a mutual love of, of the importance of color and texture, the feel and the sensuality that can be created through um, fabric and texture and color. Which you can see a little bit better in these two close-ups of those. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What, what, what drew me so much to this, I mean, is, and especially as I got to, to know your work more, I mean, so much of what we've seen ties in with the sense of androgyny 
that was popular in the 20s that was part of that world that Coward was coming out of. Um, he himself, I think, liked these gowns because it could suggest a different kind of masculinity, um, you know, combined with his more traditional matinee idol image. Uh, mm. And he said exactly what you said. He said, I love them wearing them on stage because they have swing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. He loved exactly. that effect. You know, I mean, um, I think, I think, uh, I think, I think also the, the, this, this notion always of sort of, you know, the kind of, you know, what is men's, what is women's, what is what, you know, it's, it's so, it's so fluid. And when you start putting them, putting that notion into uh, pattern and texture and the, the flow of materials, you, you, you realize that, you know, everybody would be drawn to something uh, uh, that, that, that gave you that sense of sort of voluptuousness actually, and, and, and a sense of movement, flow, and also the fact that robes are kind of, they envelop you, you know, you don't have to have the fabulous figure, the, the you know, the, the perfect legs, the, the wonderful shoulders, basically these garments, you and they become one as a sort of sensual, beautiful, um, and also, you know, it, they're, they're snug, they're, they've, got, they've got lots of elements to them. And I think all those things um, matter to us and they matter to us in the home and they matter to us when we present ourselves to others, so. Completely, um, and that was very much the world that he was talking about. Well, um, so I think at this point, I know there's been some questions coming in, I think from the audience. So if Caddy wants to rejoin us um, and-, um, and Hello. Make... <laughs> Hello. Hi, yes, um, so I have a question. Um, so if anyone else has questions that they want to type into the chat, please do. I know we've overrun a little bit, but if people want to stay on, we're happy to be here. Um, I have a question from Roger Ashton Griffiths, who asked, um, he said, this question could be asked about any creative working in the 1920s, but since we're concerned with Coward, I'll ask it of him. The Spanish flu pandemic features in surprisingly little of the lasting work of the period. Do we ever encounter this subject in his work or circle? Probably one for you, Brad. Well, circle indeed. I mean, there were, uh, you know, um, what what his generation had already been strongly affected by was tuberculosis, even pre-Spanish flu, um, and Coward himself was afflicted by it, and it was something that he carried with him uh, his whole life. Um, there were people he was close to uh, as a young man who died of uh, TB as well, um, but the the Spanish flu was uh, another sort of catastrophe. Uh, in itself, and Coward was personally um, affected by it, but survived. Um, but it has been fascinating to me in this pandemic time, because so many people have been looking back to that time of the Spanish flu. And it's amazing how little cultural production of the time addresses it. Um, it affected, I mean, it was massive. It, it affected the whole world at that time. Almost nobody was left untouched, either by personally contracting it or losing people they were close to. Um, and yet it's so underrepresented um, in the art of its time. But I think there was a fragility about human life anyway, coming out of the catastrophe of World War I. And I think that sense of loss is constantly in Coward's work. Um, he's very aware of it. He addresses it sometimes very much head on um, and sometimes very obliquely, but this sense that everything could end um, quite immediately is very often um, president in his work, and there are sudden deaths uh, that happen. And I can't imagine that that wasn't affected by all of this, by TB, by the Spanish flu, by the Great War, um, the sense that life could be over in a second. And of course, that gave so much animation to the work of the 1920s. But do any of the other panelists have thoughts on this? Well, My thought is it, it did simply come too soon after the First World War, which had created so many so much sort of a, a different cultural um, range of activity. And, uh, and I think the end of the war was, you know, despite the Spanish flu, I think there was this 
determination to look towards the future and you know view the next decade as a kind of uh, rebirth and you know just um extending the pain <laughs> with um you know doing some plays about the uh, pandemic um i think just wasn't um what anybody wanted to sit and watch at the theater but there weren't antibiotics the people died you died if you were ill you either recovered or you yeah. died it was a matter that was normal so the pan the spanish flu was nothing out of the the norm in our graveyard in my village in 1880 11 children died in one family from a fever within three weeks it's on one gravestone so it was normal a friend has journals from the 1760s of one of his ancestors and mrs hurt goes to visit mr so and so he's ill either he recovers or he dies and that was normal there weren't antibiotics if you cut yourself you either recovered or you died up until 1940 or whenever antibiotics came in. Well, they started basically at the time of the First World War and beyond. But yes, exactly. Yeah. That was the that was the choice. It was pretty stark and it was not. And, and sudden yeah. death even of young people was not unknown. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, uh, yesterday, I was planting bulbs on my parents' graves. Other family members for two or three hundred years, some died at 10, some die at 90. You died, you live and die. You know where you're going to be buried, so that's all right. So that's, <laughs> that's comforting. Yeah. Um, I had a, a further question that um, um, our, our guests are being uh, a little bit shy of questions, but that's all right, because I had a question uh, of my own, just um, uh, if we have time. I wanted to ask the panel more widely, what elements of contemporary fashion do you think Noel and his circle would have approved of? What things sort of happening now do you think they would like uh, or even dislike? You know, what are the kind of um, connective threads perhaps that, um, uh, that might cause the circle around Coward in the 20s and 30s to kind of um, applaud our current generation of designers? It's interesting, I, mean, I trained as a fashion designer, it's interesting that he was very anti so much as he grew old, having broken all the, all the rules when he was young. I'm wearing a polar neck or turtle neck as the Americans call it. Um, and even as a child in the 60s and 70s, if a man wore a blazer and a turtle neck, it was regarded as a bit too racy, he was either in London or a racing something to do with racing or he was a spiv and that's what I mean and the same with suede shoes a man wore with a blazer suede shoes it was regarded as not nice whereas Coward was doing that in the 20s and certainly in the 60s as an older man and my father was of the generation after Coward and and all his friends and it was regarded as not quite dumb <laughs> So, you know, so it, it is quite interesting how, what, I mean, what, what would he say now? I don't know. He'd probably, as an old man, he'd be looking down his nose. But as a younger man, but as an older man, he was wearing sort of narrow jackets, which people did not wear with gold buttons and things. That was regarded, what he was wearing was regarded as a somewhat gay or queer as it would have been called then. Mm. And he was far ahead of the curve, even in that fashion. You know, he yeah. was doing that in the mid fifties. It didn't really, you know, catch on more widely until the sixties. So it's, I think it's very hard to, you know, to, to put a, a limit on him. It, he's constantly surprising in the things that he embraces and the things that he uh, shows disdain for. But I think he was constantly fascinated by the mix of the traditional and the new. And I think any designers who he was looking towards that had that sensibility today I think he would still embrace. I think he'd still be fascinated by um, the people who have taken in those kinds of traditions. I think the work, you know, that um, Georgina has done, you know, would be fascinating to Coward um, in continuing that tradition, but also taking it someplace completely new, both in the terms of the conception and the media uh, and the way it's used. I mean, um, 
he, Lawrence, and all that lot were all, everything they did was new. Everything was breaking ground. It's Absolutely. interesting to think what um, these people, what fashion labels today these people would choose. I would put Gladys in probably Victoria Beckham and Osman. Clean lines, sharp tailoring, yes. you know, muted colours. That's what I would put Gladys in. I don't know what Gertrude would have, would have worn. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was interesting, when they did the film Star and they got a, a fashion designer, uh, Donald Brooks, to design the clothes for Julie Andrews, there isn't one dress that Gertrude Lawrence would have worn. <laughs> because they were all too overstated, too in your face. Everything was understated and it was, that was the whole point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just wanted to ask about that. Uh, it, we touched on it in the conversation, but I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this. Um, something that emerged for me again and again in the exhibition was, especially with the designers in the first part of his career, that Coward was using almost exclusively English designers. And they had an understanding of the world that he was representing that I think was quite unique. Um, early on, I remember Michael sharing with me a quote from um, Anne Messel, who became Countess of Ross, who was a longtime Hartnell client, who beautifully summed up how different he was in designing uh, clothes that really worked for an English woman of that time. And it was distinct from Paris fashion or any other part of the world that was, you know, it was, it was something unique uh, about English fashion. Do any of you see that thread as being important? And is there anybody who's continuing that today? I suppose Alec Alexander McQueen, but he's now gone. So mm -hmm. um, it's understated. The only understated person is Duchess of Cambridge. Yeah. I mean, un understated um, and much imitated would be Margaret Howell, you know. Oh, I mean, yeah. that's elegant. Um, you know, and for, for sort of timeless, really. Very, uh, I think, based around Catherine Hepburn. Gladys would have worn that when she was at the mill, I think. She would have worn Margaret Howell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Coming out by the barn door. <laughs> I mean, another, another, you know, current designer who I think would be very interesting in this context is Grace Wales Bonner. Um, oh, yeah. Know, the kind of, that kind of dandyism of the 1920s and 30s often reinterprets it for women, um, you know, these masculine cut suits, um, but also picks up on uh, the colonial legacy, you know, um, and, uh, you know, is rediscovering how that can work in a, in a contemporary context. Um, mm. But um, really interesting uh, to think about. Caddy, maybe if we have one more audience question and we can wind um, things yes, up. Yes, I have a question uh, that is um, perhaps not so related to fashion, um, but it's to ask whether Coward had any connection to Constance Spry um, and uh, being aware of the recent Garden Museum exhibition about how she drew in a range of talent um, for her ventures very much as Coward did. Um, was, there, was there any association there? Michael, you're muted. You probably have something to say about this, though. Yeah, we're not hearing you again. Let me see if we can do anything at this end on that. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Because it said the host ha had, un had muted me, so I couldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> we freed you, you wanted to know about <laughs> Constance Spry, who was a yeah. great friend of Victor Stiebel, so they certainly overlapped. I have no knowledge of Noel Coward ever using constant spry though. But one thing I did want to say, which actually links to the flu epidemic in a way, is the fact that everybody, but everybody smoked and drank in the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. And we forget that now, but you know, for a time in the early stages of COVID, those who smoked a lot were deemed to be the least likely to catch it. <laughs> so this has proven to be true, I believe, but um, 
there was a case for saying that uh, tobacco and strong alcohol certainly made people much tougher than they than they otherwise would have been. I don't know if it increased their lifespan. I suspect it didn't. But I do remember when I first went to New York in the early 70s that when we'd go down Fifth Avenue in the evening and there'd be elderly people absolutely paralytic being helped out to their cars. And I asked somebody about this and they said, well, that's the generation that grew up on bootleg liquor in the 20s. And if they could survive that, you'd survive anything. <laughs> but I do think you see, life has changed so much in every way that to say, what would a designer think of this or that today from that period is kind of irrelevant because they would have adapted just as they all adapted to the mini skirt and mm -hmm. so on. So I don't think there's any great point in saying what would what would Molyneux have thought of uh, fashion today or Hartnell. Of course, they'd have hated it because they didn't design it themselves. <laughs> and that was that was actually true at the time. So it, that was not likely to change. The only one who ever said anything really nice about other designers was Dior, I think. Mm -hmm. Certainly none of the other ones that I've, that I've read and read and read said much that was kind about any of them, except that Hardy Amy's got on terribly well with Molyneux in the war and modeled himself on Molyneux style. So that perhaps is, is symptomatic. But with Molyneux, when you've reduced everything to the bare minimum, what is there left? As we've seen, it becomes very difficult for a new designer to create something extraordinarily new and vibrant that can be worn on a daily basis. I'm not talking about what's designed at Dior now, which is really just to sell scent on the catwalk, but you know, clothes such as Georgina is selling one, wonderful dressing gowns. Uh, I'm a great addict of dressing gowns myself. These are things that one can constantly revive and change the shape and the color and the form. So there I think is, uh, there I think is an indication of where designers might go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. That, that, that's a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, they're beautiful. I long to have all of those. <laughs> oh, do, do help yourself to the ones in the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, I might do that. <laughs> I get them first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll get them when you've worn them. <laughs> we can have a lending library. Exactly. Um, I, I did want to respond to something about the constant spry question is really interesting because it, it, it goes to the heart of something that the exhibition is very much about. There was this incredible creative network around Coward. Um, and it's amazing how closely related so many of these people are. Um, Constance Spry was uh, not only a, a great floral designer, she really took floral design to a state of art. And she was very much courted by many of these people. She used to provide the flowers to Victor Stiebel's showroom, which was you know, the epitome of chic. She worked a lot with Siri Mom, the interior designer who designed several of Coward's interiors and was a great friend. Constance Spry was involved with the painter Gluck, who's represented by two uh, images in the exhibition, who was very close to Coward's world. So there must have been some overlap. And I think it's, it's a very important part of this story is how closely related all of these people were. And cooking. Yes, oh, and cooking, indeed. exactly. Constance Spry, I've just taken off my shelf, the Constance Spry cookbook, <laughs> which belonged to Heather Jason. <laughs> exactly, and there were these extraordinary people who were creating creative careers that didn't exist really before. Well, uh, I, I, I showed that picture of um, the Duchess of Gloucester in a Hartnell dress photographed by Yvonne. The flowers there were all by Constance Spry. She also worked with Hartnell. So, this is exactly what you're saying. They were all people who really were very, very creative and had actually no firm basis for their creativity. I don't think any of them, had, for example, <laughs> these dress designers had studied how to make a dress. Hartnell couldn't cut a thing or sew anything. Stiebel maybe just about pinned something. So it's all, uh, uh, 
and mingling of minds and intellects, which is so fascinating. They were all jobbing artists. I mean, even, even into the arts of John Piper editing the Shell Guide to Britain. Yes. Uh, Benjamin Britten, you know, sort of uh, the, everybody just were jobbing artists. They did things because it was all creativity. Coventry Cathedral is one of the great things, uh, icons of that, you know, bringing together yes. art in every format. It, mm. I mean, but it doesn't seem to happen quite so much now. We mm. don't have jobbing artists, designers designing for the stage, you know, in, interior decorators perhaps doing stage sets. It, 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 people are trained to do certain things now and yes. they stick within that thing where everybody was a jobbing artist and they would, whatever came along, they did. Mm. Yes. It's difficult because I think, I think you know, my field, I, I constantly have, and for years, rushed up to various people who are doing different a a aspects of in the design world, not, not my field, something completely different, and said, what about a collaboration? Wouldn't it be wonderful, you know, to do something, you know, work with, a, with an engineer to... Yeah put something into their materials that would mean that, you know, you could contribute your color, your, 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 the sense of touch into the materials and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just been absolutely impossible. Collaborations are just about creeping in, but the notion that, you know, wonderful things can come out of people um, functioning and throwing ideas about in each other's areas. I mean, it's hard work getting people to sort of open out to that idea. And um, I've, I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've pounced on to, you know, at, actually in, the, in the, um, uh, the Royal Designers for Industry, lots of different designers I've gone up to and said, hello, hello, I'm just, I love what you're doing. Would you ever consider a, co a collaboration? You know, because I think it's so exciting and it's, you know, I, for some reason, it's it's it seems more difficult now, and I don't know why. I don't know why. Someone else might know. Everybody keeps in their box. Mm, it's true. It's true. Well, I suppose in a way there isn't the scope that there used to be either. Say with fabric production, you think that Messel used to do fabric designs and Beaton as well, mm. Mm. the Seckers, but those sort of um, firms have all gone to the wall, really. Mm. Probably mm. a matter of cost, apart from anything else. Mm. Mm. I think I think that, and and also the 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 sort of the lack of support for those kinds of industry, actually, bit by bit, whittled away by things coming from elsewhere and stuff. Yes. So, yes. I mean, yeah. we 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 basically had to do every single element of the work that we wanted to do because. We simply couldn't get anyone else to do it because by the time we were, were starting out, um, people had shut down those sides of, you know, experimentation and so on. And in fact, their minds had been focused on trying to just keep themselves going. So I think um, that's why what we did at the time that we were doing it was 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 considered very experimental because and we were able to do it, but but only because we we made the print table, we made the thing, we made the that, and 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 actually, and we we were determined to to do it. Um, but you know, it was a great shame because I think our our great our original thought was to combine with others mm. and to to use these wonderful skills that were in the you know the textile industries right across the board, but they were just they weren't being supported and, 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 you know, industries were being decimated, you know, quite rapidly, actually. So. I think it still happens in France and Italy, but not here. Mm, mm, I that's think that's true. It, it's just, it's just gone here for the time being yeah. anyway. It's the, it's the great homogenization. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, everybody wants to be. If, if you go back to the 1930s, you see these people aren't just working together, they're at theatrical first nights together, they're in all London's nightclubs together. So I just think it was all done on a handshake. You know, there wasn't really sort of the um, legal framework that people yeah. have to work well, A gentleman's bond was his handshake. Yeah. 
exactly. Mm. Yeah, and it was uh, an English English gentleman's bond <laughs> with his handshake. <laughs> or woman's, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, Gladys Car Carlthrop, she was a painter. Ooh. She showed some paintings to Ivan Novello, who she knew, mm. and he recommended her to, you know, that, it just sort of to um, Charles Cochrane, and it just sort uh, of went from there. Great. I mean, it, but it's yeah. also fascinating that these women were working in what was technically, we now say, a man, man's world. Gertrude Lawrence was the highest paid actress on both sides of the Atlantic before women had the vote. At, under 30 in mm. Britain, and she was yeah. under 30. She was also a divorcee mm. with, a, with a child. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. <laughs> it takes time for people to catch up. <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> I don't think they actually thought about it. They just got on and did it. Yeah, and quite. Every trick that they could pull. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's still that's still the case. I mean. You have to, you just, I mean, the, the amount of, I mean, sorry to reflect back onto what we did, but I mean, the amount of sort of, you know, indrawn breaths and sucked teeth sort of going, oh no, oh no, 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 we can't do that, we can't do that. And you just had to say, right, okay, we're gonna do it. It can be done, you know? And so, um, and I, I don't know whether that's a particularly, British approach. I mean, I don't know. Tell me. I, 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 I we, we I found it, it. I think it was. I have a feeling mm. it's at the moment. Mm. Mm. It certainly is still like that in publishing, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you want to write about somebody British. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Never to be done. <laughs> yeah. No, well, this thank is you all so much. We've gone far beyond our time, but it's been wonderful having all your contributions here. And I hope I hope everyone who's tuned in has gotten something out of it. Uh, it's been such a multifaceted look uh, at this world, Paul Coward. Thank you all so much.